Okay, hello everybody. This is Scott Nelson from the Austrian Economic Center located in Vienna, Austria. And continuing with our taking our free market roadshow online, we're checking with some of our family members to see what the state of their respective countries is. And on that note, I'm very happy to be here with Pietro Paganini, who serves as adjunct professor in business administration at Temple University of Philadelphia and at John Cabot University. He teaches in the areas of innovation and management, and amongst his many other activities, uh, Pietro is also the co-founder and curiosity officer at Competere, Policies for Sustainable Development, a platform that enhances the public debate for a smarter and more prosperous future. Welcome, Pietro. Hi, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you doing? Very well. Hopefully everybody's doing well today. I love I love that painting in the background there. I'm not I'm not sure what exactly that's supposed to be. Is there a, is there a story behind that? Yeah, it's a matter of property rights. <laughs> <laughs> how very appropriate! How very appropriate! We we'll take it. We, we just leave for our audience to find out who the guy is. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Sounds good. So I'm really glad that uh, we have the opportunity to talk because being based in Italy, in many respects, unfortunately, you're you're uh, really the heart of of this tragedy at the present moment. Um, could you just give me a rundown of what, what's the state of the situation in Italy right now in terms of people who've been infected, um, number of deceased, uh, is everyone in quarantine? What's, what's going on right now? Well, uh, yes, basically everyone is in the form of quarantine as we, most of us are uh, obliged to stay home and we can only go out just for, you know, uh, basic shopping. Uh, most of our business activity shops, you know, firms, uh, companies are all factories are all closed. Uh, what we just define as necessary uh, uh, um, goods are the ones that are being produced. So most, mostly food or, you know, some other kind of uh, uh, amenities that are good for, you know, for daily life. Um, the numbers, you know, it's, it's an interesting question yours because uh, the official numbers are talking around 80,000, 85,000. I don't remember the last number that was actually released a few minutes ago. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's somehow stabilizing, uh, but it's talking about people that have been affected and they've been recorded as affected, people that have been, you know, at the hospital and people that unfortunately have, uh, have died. And in this big number, there's a, and more than 10,000 people that have died. So it's a, it's a 10%. And this is an important number. We're talking about uh, COVID-19 is more or less, you know, uh, very fine. Some casualties around 2%, less than 2%. Here it's 10%. So there, there might be something. Then if we look at the numbers, and I don't want to go too much in details and become, uh, you know, uh, boring, but we see that the majority, and I would say 95, even 99% of these people that have died, unfortunately, they were not because of COVID-19. They also had COVID-19. So they had some other type of pathologies and then COVID-19 was one of the causes that, you know, helped, unfortunately, uh, killing this person. In terms of People that died because of COVID-19, so the unique uh, disease or, or, or pathologies was uh, given by COVID, we're talking about less than 10 people. Uh, and here there is a big discussion. Some, some doctors are arguing, well, they are all dead because of COVID-19, even though COVID was one of the pathologies. Some others are saying, no, uh, COVID-19 was just you know, a coincidence or just a helping the, the death process. Uh, and then there is two other big numbers that we are not really aware. And those numbers are the ones that are not affected by COVID-19 and the number of people that have been affected by COVID-19, but they are asymptomatic. Okay, so me and you, uh, you know, we might be uh, affected and asymptomatic. And so there is a big discussion that is not really, is, is not really uh, uh, faced and challenged over the media, unfortunately. It's mostly in small, you know, uh, uh, such a networks or in some, you know, by some doctors that are not really the media doctors. And they argue that, you know, 30, 50 percent of population might have a form of COVID-19, considering that more than 50 percent of the population has the bigger family of the coronavirus. So arguments are, 
majority of us as a coronavirus and some of us might have a COVID-19, but in an asymptomatic. Why is this important? Because this is the next question that we should ask ourselves. So when we decrease the number of affected people, so if we go down to zero, like in China right now, how do we go back to normal life? Do we just open the doors and, and leave? Or like Israel is suggesting, you know, young people first, you know, middle-aged people second. And how do we recognize if I'm a healthy person and I go out and I meet you and you are uh, healthy, but you are asymptomatic because you got COVID-19 and I'm gonna get sick. And so these are questions that, you know, are not being uh, a, a least yet and publicly not challenged. And I think it's important for us that are staying home and luckily we have nothing or no symptoms so far. It would be uh, important to understand how this will turn on, how this will change. And, uh, and unfortunately we are not at that stage. I understand our governments and I put an S governments are fighting with an emergency but I think that the emergency concerns also what's next. And that's an answer we're not seeing. So for the past four days in Italy, we saw a slight decrease of the number of people being, you know, re recognized as affected by the COVID-19, except yesterday, but apparently there was uh, a big number of checkups that has just entered and being analyzed exactly yesterday. We got the results for that. But in any case, it's a slight uh, uh, slowdown. And the curve is, is, let's say, not going down, but is decreasing slowly. Uh, question is how slow this will happen and for how long we should stay home. And what will happen once we fortunately and luckily will and hopefully will have the chance to leave uh, our, uh, our homes. You know, the government decree says by April 3rd, all the laws that we have in place will end. But we already know that this will be prolonged to probably another three or four weeks. So I, I, I'm afraid to say that for the next two, three weeks, at least we will be staying, uh, staying at home. But the question remains, how do we go out from home the day that, you know, we get to a zero uh, affected people? Right, right. So we got to start thinking more long term, in, in other words. Um, how yeah, yeah. How is the how's the health system uh, holding up in, in Italy at the moment? I mean, is the government trying well, to expand its capacity, build new hospitals, that sort of thing? What's going on there? I, I'm smiling. I shouldn't smile uh, because it's, a, it's an emergency and this drama for many people, particularly for the one that are too by the hospital. But uh, this is because of the health system, um, because the health system in Italy, elsewhere in, around Europe, and probably more in some parts and less in others, the, the healthcare system is not ready and was not ready and probably will never be ready to fight and contrast uh, such an emergency. In other words, if we, was, if we were in a perfect world, let's say, we would have been following initial British suggestion. Just, you know, just keep going on uh, with our lives. And then if you get sick, you just go to the hospital and whoever gets to the hospital, there is a bed with a ventilator and we're all safe. Uh, unfortunately, we, we didn't plan for that and we don't have, and probably it's also good that we don't have so many uh, uh, seats or beds in the hospitals because during our daily life, we don't really uh, need them. Uh, we need them for emergencies. So probably what we have missed in, in Italy, I would say, but also in the rest of Europe is a sort of intelligence trying to analyze and predict similar situation. Not necessarily COVID-19, but situation where we massively need uh, hospital beds or ventilators or some, some other kind of vaccinations or machines. That's something that we should start uh, and thinking. You know, there's been all this speculation in the past few weeks about uh, Bill Gates envisioning the virus coming or the UN uh, simulating a situation of a virus just a few months ago. Well, I think that this is not conspiration, it's just uh, exercises that we should do uh, for a future where this might happen more often. Mm. Uh, because it has always happened in history, just think about the Spanish uh, virus and disease uh, uh, less than a century ago. 
but also because now with the globalization that is a good thing, uh, it takes very short for a disease to move from a countryside village into a megalopoly. If you think about HIV, you know, HIV started, was at least rooted back at the beginning of the, 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 the 19th century, and it took over 60 years to get to, sorry, the, the 20th century, and to get two, 50 years to get to, to become a sort of explosive uh, pathology. Why? Because it took 50 years to get from a remote village in Africa to a big city in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, now this process has been shortened. So think about what happened in China from an a, a outdoor market into a megalopoly in less than a few days and few hours because you know of this global uh, global world that I, I still argue is a great thing. You know, most people now are saying, oh, because of globalization, we're getting sick. Well, I'm saying, yeah, you know, globalization is a good thing. And then with the good things, you also get some side effects. We need to be ready to fight these side, uh, side effects. Fair enough. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, it's interesting, actually, when you mentioned sort of that this was a, a kind of situation, something a, perhaps a recurring thing that we might have to get used to it. It reminded me there have been a couple of articles that were published recently in, um, in Le Figaro that were saying exactly the exact same sort of thing and suggesting that depending on how this all plays out, it may actually be become a recurring sort of thing, a yearly, like the yearly seasonal flu or something like that. And that maybe we need to get ready for that kind of a situation yeah there's there's two other aspects that i've been studying you know or at least reading in 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 the past weeks and and the first one is that as you said and as i said previously you know we are more interconnected uh but you know today i wouldn't follow or or get engaged too much with a conspiracy theory but you know i wouldn't doubt that somebody in some kind of country is thinking about it making or transforming a conspiracy theory into practice and thinking, oh, can I use a virus and biologically program a virus in the future and use this virus? You know, a, a biological war comes from there in a way. So we have to be careful as well, saying today is a biological problem, but in the future it might become, uh, you know, uh, uh, directed uh, by some kind of dictatorship or by an hostile country. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, you know, by staying at home, uh, uh, we realize that we are actually, I don't know the word in English, so apologize me for that. Still, I'm Italian. Uh, but, you know, we, have, we are becoming weaker in terms of bacteria, for instance, mm -hmm. because we're, we're not outside. And uh, this is not helping our immunitarian system to protect us you know the best way to uh, uh, beat and, and, and fight against virus is through our body even before uh, drugs is the bacteria we have in our body are the first system that protects us from viruses then we need also you know medicines and likely we were you know uh, smart enough to develop good medicines and drugs but the first the first def the defense we have is inside our body and the risk is that by staying at home or in a future where we become too much careful and protecting too much ourselves by using technology, then our body becomes extremely weak. So we need to be able to balance the technology on one side to protect ourselves, on the other side still, you know, using our body. Uh, you know, I'm always making fun. I'm here with my dog. And I always think, how is my dog surviving all these bacteria and viruses? And the reason why is because they don't have, you know, vaccination, they don't have drugs. Of course, they have, a, let's say, a shorter life and, let's say, a more miserable life than we have, of course. But still, they have some uh, uh, defenses against, you know, basic uh, diseases. So the risk, uh, in Italy, we call it the earth, the earth uh, illness, the fact that kids don't play outside anymore. And by playing outside, you develop those defense forces that allow you to be stronger in situations like the uh, COVID-19. COVID Although you, you, you mentioned your, your dog, actually, I have a couple of cats here as well. I'll tell you, we might not be doing so well right now, but everyone's pets, I think they're absolutely loving this. You know, their masters are at home and can hang out with them the whole day. So uh, at least they're, they're seeing a sort of silver lining in this. Yeah.
Uh, when we turn from, uh, from the health issue, um, and you mentioned side effects earlier of globalization and that sort of thing, let's go to the economy because that's obviously uh, an incredibly important thing that's been affected by all of this. What is the state of the, the economy in Italy when it comes to, to unemployment and layoffs and that sort of thing? And what's the government uh, doing in, in response? You know, here is, uh, I, I like the statement that was used a uh, time ago by some economists. You know, if you ask me now about the weather, I just open the window and can see the weather here. Uh, and that's the number of deaths that unfortunately we are experiencing today. But if you ask me about the economy, well, if I check the weather, it won't be of help because I don't know how the weather will be tomorrow. I don't know how the weather will be in the next three weeks. So here, if you ask me how the economy will be in the next three weeks, my answer is I don't know. What I fear, and I don't want to you know, worry anybody around us, but what I fear is the number of deaths that this crisis will create in a long period of time because of unemployment, because of bankruptcy, because people that are simply staying at home too long and they get crazy and they start you know, going out of mind. So there will be consequences in a long period of time. So I can say with happiness, good, this is not the Spanish disease of a century ago. We are saving millions of lives. Let's not just look at the, the one that are dying. Let's look at the one we're saving. But at the same time, in the current and contemporary life, we are more used to live a nice and well and well-being life. So, you know, the fact that we have to give up something is worrying us. So I'm a, I see that a lot of people will suffer for this. But economically, uh, the government, of course, has to intervene because there is no other way. The government is telling us to stay home and there are companies... Uh, 90%, I would say, or 95%, I don't remember the exact number of companies are closed, factories are closed, and people are home. And, you know, because of this situation, I don't think that the majority are aware of what will happen next. Like tomorrow or the day after Monday, salaries will come, so people will still receive a check. But if we look at the majority of people that are working in the tourist uh, business or tourism business or restaurants or bars, uh, these people usually work, you know, black market or they re receive a daily salary or a weekly salary. Well, these people have no salary already. So they're not going to spend and they would probably have a hard time. Second, people in companies, I'm talking management level, so not just blue collar, traditional blue collar. Probably from next month, today they get a check, but in next month, some of them will not get a check. Look at the unemployment level in the United States. So people will definitely go and uh, ask for uh, support by the government. Government has promised an injection of 25 billion euros to support factories and to support, you know, people being laid off. What we don't know, though, is how this is going to work and when is this is going to start. So I think that psychologically an economy is, you know, done by people. Uh, today, we are pretty safe because people are still, okay, nothing bad has happened. But from next week and the weeks after, some people will start having a lot of serious issues. And government has to clarify how money is going to be injected from the top down to the regular, the regular person. And I'm afraid that that's not clear. As well as we see all the weakness of Europe, where there are very different approaches to how Europe should, you know, uh, let's say, uh, play, which is the role that uh, the Europe should uh, should play. Obviously, Italy has a position that I'm not supporting. I'm not sharing. That is the one that Europe should be uh, should follow solidarity approach. But my question is, what is solidarity, and why Europe should be solidarity? There is no agreement that Europe should be solidarity, and we shouldn't forget that Italy has been that country that for a long time would be spending more. Uh, 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 that it could over, you know, our possibilities. And we pay that. We pay the fact that we've done, we have a great healthcare system in some parts of Italy, luckily in the north, where we have actually the most mm -hmm. cases of coronavirus, but it's a, it's a terrible system in the south. Um, so why? Because money has been poorly spent or has been wasted or, you know, corruption, criminality and so on. So how is Italy going to do so? They've been promising a lot of words, 
tax reduction, no taxation at the end of the month, uh, no taxation over salaries, a lot of things. But so far, concretely, uh, we don't see and hear anything. Unfortunately, current and contemporary politician, politicians have a lot of ideas, but most of these idea, the ideas don't have an economic ground. It's like, hey, I'm gonna give you 10,000 euros and you, can, you might ask me, okay, where is the money coming from? Well, somebody's giving money, government. Oh, government doesn't have money. Oh, Europe, Europe has the money. Oh, Europe doesn't have the money. Oh, bad, that's Merkel. Merkel doesn't wanna give money. That's the thinking of people and it's a very dangerous thing because then people are not educated to do things on their own. They always rely on somebody else. And Italy, because of its historical tradition, is a country where we always tend to rely on you know, the prince, the king, the government, the local state, and so on and so forth. And that's a cultural, let's say, uh, uh, cultural aspects that unfortunately will have to change in the next two or three centuries, cannot change in the next two months. Fair enough. Yeah. I know you wanted to have a, a, a practical answer, but there is no practical answer because government has just promised a lot, but we don't know how. No, that's, uh, that's, that's fair enough. Absolutely. Um, how, how, are the, how are the people taking it? Like just the average population, so far as you can get a sense of that. I mean, are they, um, do they support these quarantine measures? Are they, are they afraid of the economic consequences? Um, you know, the ones that are afraid of the economic consequences are the ones uh, that run a company or they run a business because they are facing reality already. Uh, then people that, are, let's say, are regular employees, they start gradually feeling the problem. Uh, you know, but the majority of our workers are in this government, you know, schools, healthcare, and so on. So they, they are used to have a salary at the end of the month, whatever happens. Mm -hmm. They're not entrepreneurs. Uh, so, but these people sooner or later will be affected, uh, will be affected too. So far, the sense of solidarity I discussed earlier has emerged. So we all get together and say, you know, like in Spain, on the balconies and on the windows, and we put the banners and we clap the doctors. Well, I always say it was better to clap the doctors five years ago, not now or it would be great to clap the doctors uh, tomorrow. So we live with this rhetoric that is still the rhetoric that we had, unfortunately, during the fascist time and earlier, you know, during the, the municipalities uh, or the communes uh, uh, when Italy was not a unified. There is a, a lot of rhetoric in saying, we are a great country, we can make it, we will overcome any situation and people still buy this. But there will definitely be a point where people will start, you know, thinking people are not stupid. They believe we are stupid. And they start thinking, well, something is wrong here. We need to take action. And that could be, I'm afraid, and hopefully we will never get there. It might be a breaking point. Um, don't forget, Italy is not a country based on individual freedom. It's a country where there's always somebody else taking care of us. And we see this from the media. The media are officially asking us to stay at home and they do it through the VIP media messages like where you have famous actors that are on TV or football players saying stay home you got to stay home that's the rule stay home don't go around affecting people uh, well the problem is exactly that that we should get a message of choice where we decide to stay home because we understand the reason why we're home or we should be home and that's a matter of responsibility and individual responsibility that goes together with freedom. Uh, but still we live in a, in, a, in a country where the idea is somebody has to tell us what to do. Uh, and you know, this works, but it works well in two conditions. One, you have people respecting rules. And at the same time, you know, we don't like respecting rules. So we get rules, but we don't respect them. So in a way we try to emulate China, but we are not China. On the other side, we are not even the US or UK. So we are not <laughs> responsible enough. So the problem is that either you have rules respected, fully respected, or you have a, city, a, a, a wide share responsibility uh, by citizens. And I'm afraid that if you don't follow rules, but you don't have this responsibility, there will be a breaking point. Well, 
uh, what people will start reacting and say, okay, why are we home if things are not going to be better? I need to go work. You know, um, I, I have a lot of friends that who are entrepreneurs and they are incredibly angry because they say it's not a matter of disrespecting the working conditions. It's a matter of producing because at the end of the month, I have to pay 50 salaries, 60 salaries, 30 salaries, even five salaries. And if I can't, then I have to cut jobs. And if I cut jobs, these people will, these families will be home alone. So uh, my hope is that we will be able to solve these problems uh, right away. And I say in, in terms of faith, I, I don't like to appeal to faith, but in terms of faith, I hope it will happen like with SARS some years ago, that it suddenly will disappear. Uh, because if it does not disappear and we still have to wait for a vaccine, I'm afraid that there will be some social turmoils that Europe, the U.S. cannot really, uh, cannot really face. And on the other side, there will be the risk that countries like China that have been very good in containing this crisis will, you know, take over. Where there is a, when there is loneliness, you always get the bad company. Uh, instead, when there is friendship, unity, then you keep the bad company away. But it, uh, now that you mentioned China, actually, and I know that, for example, you, you moderated a very successful and interesting uh, webinar yesterday on geopolitics, China, and the European Union. Uh, given, for example, statements that have commonly been you know, made by uh, Luigi Di Maio in regards to uh, the, Chinese, you know, the Chinese brothers of the Italian people and that sort of thing in China, now donating you know, medical equipment and, and doctors over to Italy, what do you make of the relation between Italy and China, especially you know, over the course as this virus continues to develop and, and even after it's all resolved? I mean, where is that heading, basically? Well, you mentioned a name that reminds me of the Trojan horse. You know, uh, every big propaganda country <laughs> finds a stupid Trojan horse. And I think that China has found its Trojan horse. Uh, and you mentioned the name. I didn't, uh, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, well, China is smart. Uh, China has the capacity to, you know, overcome any individual rights and impose a behavior and they cure the country, basically, or at least that's what we think. Uh, they had a responsibility, of course, of not informing us with all the story. Uh, but now they are, they are playing smart. They play their propaganda that is very different from the Russian one. Russia tend to create confusion um, and make chaos. Uh, China creates its own propaganda in a form of apologizing for what happens. But they are smart. You know, they saw that uh, Italy and probably next will be Spain. And I know that they are already donating to other European countries. They understand that there is a loneliness that there is an opportunity for them to come in and show that how good they are, typically propaganda. And they are smart because they are not investing so much. They are just send, sending in 12 doctors, a uh, few masks. Uh, they are trying to donate money. I know that there are uh, Chinese funds that are coming to Europe promising donation, uh, keep showing this sense of solidarity that Europe is not showing. So, you know, Italians, they read the news and they see well, China is helping us. They're, at the end, they are not so bad. Oh, they are not, you know, respecting your freedom. Well, who cares? But they are taking care of me. Uh, China understood that. And with a very low investment, they might, you know, make a big win. Um, in, in, in this respect, also, uh, nothing happens in China because uh, an investment fund wants to make, give money to us or they want to send a couple of million of masks. It happens because there is a very careful managed uh, strategy that is being pushed by the Communist Party and by the government. So it's, it's not a coincidence. It's not a, an act of faith by a Chinese company that says, let's go to Italy and help them. You know, immediately, a uh, few days after the big uh, uh, infection started in Milan, we got videos from China, from Huang, of Chinese people saying, Bella Italia, we, we will win together in Italian. So even Chinese people who are speaking Italian means they've been educated, they've been instructed to say so. And that's part to me of a propaganda. Now, in a conspiracy approach, you would say that was planned. 
I, I don't want to like, I don't want to think about it, but I would say they, they were waiting for this in a way. And they understood that in December, China was, uh, was being defeated by Trump. Trump played an incredible big game when it came to the trade war and pushed China to the corner. And now because of this virus, China is basically able to own the world if, uh, if they, do, they do want. I just hope that there will be a clear understanding by European leadership that we can cope with China, we can accept their help because I think it's respectful to accept. But on the other side, we should make clear that in this border, it's us. In, their, in the other border, it's them. And we're two different things. And we appreciate whatever they do for us, but nothing has to be given back. Because there will be a day where they come, knock the door and say, hey, you remember I was the one helping you. And I'm afraid that uh, that day will come, will come very soon. It will jeopardize infrastructure. It will be a threat for our freedom. And you know, technology is what China is using today to penetrate our freedoms. Fair enough. All right. Well, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, Pietro, but by way of um, uh, conclusion, uh, if you care to, to look into your crystal ball, as it were, and see, I mean, where do you, where do you think we're going to be a few months down the line? I mean, is, is uh, Italy going to bounce back, you know, successfully after the whole coronavirus is over in terms of uh, its economy and that sort of thing? Or at the very least, what do you think people who are, you know, observing Italy, what should they be keeping an eye on? You know, uh, it's hard to say, uh, but you, you want to guess. My guess is that it's not, it's not the end of, human, of humanity. We're here, we will, we will survive, we will win. I don't know the price. Price will be negative, but as today we are being defeated by a virus, tomorrow we will win our victory. We have the technology to go back to work again. Things will, be, will move fast. As they go quickly down, they will go quickly up. In the middle, there is casualties, people that are dying. In the middle, there will be people that will be left behind. That depends on the time, on the timing. If I have to be, look in the crystal ball, uh, unless this is something completely unpredictable, so the virus is something more alien than we think, uh, I'm, I'm seeing that one day we wake up, like for the SARS uh, in 2002 or three, I remember, and the virus is gone because of weather condition, because of pollution, whatever. Uh, it's fate. It's fate. It's not science. It's fate. Uh, otherwise, we, well, we have to wait for a vaccination. And here, let me conclude with this. For years, Europe has been attacking pharmaceutical company and big pharma, accusing them because of property rights, because of pricing. And now we're here begging the pharmaceutical industry and the great innovation they do for a vaccine. So we should think about this more carefully. Not us, but the others. They should think about this. Well, that's, that's a wonderful note to conclude on. That's uh, Pietro Paganini, adjunct professor in business administration at Temple uh, University of Philadelphia and at John Cabot University, as well as co-founder and curiosity officer at Competere. Pietro, thank you so much for your time. Thank you to you.